thank you again for joining us. And as I said before, if you do have any questions uh, during the webinar, I will address them in the Q&A session towards the end. Um, this won't be a super long webinar today. We'll probably be done in about 20 minutes or so. So just bear with me for any questions that you have about the trip. I'll just mention it briefly because this is sort of a special webinar as we've already talked about the main program to Japan. But our philosophy at Wheel and Anchor is all about bringing travelers together, specifically Canadian travelers, people who have a bit of a like-minded approach to what travel is all about and uh, who sort of uh, you know understand and appreciate what my vision is for travel, which is not just mine, but a collective vision. That is that we take a little bit more time uh, to uh, really soak in the places that we go uh, and, and the experiences and the cultures and the food and the wine and all those great things. Um, and we make some great friends along the way. So that's our philosophy. Here's a quick shot from our last trip to Japan and Korea that happened obviously before the pandemic. Um, and you can see this kind of fun that we have. Um, and, you know, most of the people, well, I shouldn't say that. In, in the meantime, a lot of people that come on our trips um, already know each other from either past trips or their friends that, that came on the trip because they talked their other friends to coming in on it. Um, and, you know, because it's a, a very relaxed vibe, we can sort of let our hair down sometimes, if you will, and dress up in kimonos like we did uh, here uh, outside of Tokyo in Japan. Uh, and, and, you know, that's part of the fun of it. Because again, if you travel with a bunch of friends, as opposed to just joining a, an ordinary tour group, it's a different experience. And invariably, you become well connected to um, the people around you. And as I say, of course, the, um, the people that we meet along the way. So join me on the webinar today, as usual, uh, Paula, our senior trip specialist, wave hello, Paula, so everybody knows <laughs> who the, the face on the other end of the line when you're called into our office uh, and of course Joel who does our technical support um, and today uh, I'm going to be taking you as many of you have obviously booked into our Japan trip um, which is sold out for next year in case you weren't already aware uh, it went amazingly fast uh, so if you're however I'll, I'll say this right now if you if you haven't booked into Japan uh, and you thought oh now you're hearing me say that it's sold out um, if you're still interested to go, we are building a wait list because we may put on a second departure. Uh, because quite frankly, I didn't uh, I didn't anticipate that it would uh, it would sell out so quickly. So if that's the case, you just drop Paula a note and say, oh, I still want to go to Japan, uh, and um, uh, and we will uh, see what happens over the next few weeks. Um, again, this webinar obviously is taking you on a little bit of a journey around Seoul, Korea, and Taipei, Taiwan, which are designed to be before and after our Japan program. However, of course, if you have, uh, have you always wanted to visit these, uh, these great cities or these countries and then go on and do something else in Asia, you're free to do that as well. So even though they're attached to Japan, they are mutually exclusive. So you can, um, you can book them on their own. So just to let you know about that. So let's first of all, talk about South Korea. Uh, and um, as you know, South Korea sits on a peninsula uh, adjacent to Japan, obviously with North Korea in between, and I'll talk about that in a second, and not far from uh, from uh, Japan itself. And, you know, Korea has a long and interesting history, and obviously uh, the history since uh, the Korean War is, is most interesting. The division between North and South, of course, we read about all the politics all the time, the tensions that exist there. Um, and yet, uh, you know, people in, when you go to Korea, what the interesting thing that I find always is, is that the people are relatively chill about the whole thing. Um, you know, everybody's aware of what's going on. And, you know, and, and this is one of those opportunities to travel to a part of the world and really understand what the local mindset is and how people are relating to this situation, the geopolitics of the area. Um, we're obviously focusing our trip here in Seoul. Um, at one point, we were considering to, to do a broader trip around Korea, but I, I did a lot of thinking and a lot of searching, you know, what would make the ideal itinerary. And quite frankly, what people most like about Seoul, and this is the, the what we, the, um, the feedback we got from the last time we went, is that, um, sorry, about Korea in general, is, is that Seoul is really sort of so representative of the whole country. And of course, there's all kinds of, you know, other cities and towns that you can visit. Um, and yet, you get so much of what's there just by visiting the city. 
We will be staying right in Myeongdong, which is one of the most vibrant parts of Seoul. Uh, and um, obviously flying in from Canada, depending on where you're coming from, there's various routes that you can take. Uh, and there's direct flights from Toronto, Vancouver, that you can get directly into Seoul. So it's pretty accessible. Um, we will spend five nights, as I say, in Myeongdong. And from here, we'll explore, explore different aspects of the city itself. There's a few of the labels that are on here. We will make a day trip up to the DMZ, that's the demilitarized zone, which is right the border basically between North and South Korea, very eye-opening experience for people. Um, and we'll obviously have time to take it in on our own. It's a vast city. And again, one of the things that's fascinating about Korea, South Korea, is how this country has gone from being you know, relatively poor. If we think about what Korea was some 40 years ago, it was um, uh, sort of pre-industrialized. It was a lot of agricultural. Um, and of, of course, you know, the government made moves to put a, tr a tremendous amount of effort into um, the IT sector in particular, electronics, manufacturing. Um, you know, we are familiar with the automotive industry from there, uh, companies like Hyundai, uh, and uh, it has just exploded um, and done so in a in a very um, how shall I say in a very social way because there's so many things that underpin uh, society there uh, that again that's what makes it I think particularly interesting to visit so we will arrive into Seoul of course because it's a long journey from Canada we never plan anything the first day after a long trans-pacific journey we'll pick you up we'll bring you um, to the hotel uh, which is a lovely boutique hotel this is the other reason I wanted to design the trip this way is check into a nice hotel, stay there for five nights. It just allows you to settle in and you're not in a rush to do stuff. I mean, we have a fairly full program, um, but uh, once you get there, you're going to be anxious to get out and walk around. And because we're in Myeongdong, which is uh, full of restaurants and cafes, it's sort of the neon light capital, like the Ginza in Tokyo. Um, so there's lots of action going on. And yet we have this beautiful, um, you know, four-star boutique hotel in a great part of town to stay in. Uh, and, um, as I say, no big plans for the first evening. Um, we'll then carry into the, I call it the touristy part of the tour uh, on the first day. We'll visit some of the highlights. In particular, you can't go to Seoul without visiting Yongbakjung Palace. That is the uh, main imperial palace that is um, not that far from our hotel. Nothing is really that far from our hotel other than the airport, which is about an hour outside of town. Uh, and uh, hopefully if our timing is right, which I'm sure it will be, we'll take in the changing of the guard and we'll see all the pomp and circumstance and it'll be this will be an interesting preface to Japan where well it's hard to even describe the cultural difference the feel when you go uh, because you know Korea is is a little bit more down and dirty than you'll find in Japan right I compare it to like Germany versus Switzerland kind of thing that's you know from a European perspective that's how you might uh, sort of compare the two and so on our highlights day as I say we'll visit the palace um, and we'll also go into Bokchong village uh, which I think is an interesting part of town because it's where we get to see a, a traditional Korean neighborhood if you will how the houses all look how you know in some ways they they're certainly different in in design and, and flavor from home and there's there's a lot more detail put into the um, exterior but at the same time it feels very neighborhoody it feels a little bit European or North American um, and again this is I think that's sort of a, a a testament to uh, Korea as it compares to you know as we'll see when we look at Japan and uh, uh, Taiwan after that um, then, as I say, we'll make a, 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 a we'll spend a full half day or a better part of a half day up in the DMZ. Uh, and uh, what happens when we go up there is we, we we take our own private coach up there, and then we are obliged to join sort of this public. Everything is uh, quite tightly secured up there, and it's already fascinating as you're driving up along the Han River. Uh, and then at one point, you'll start to see uh, the fortifications. And of course, the border between North and South Korea is one of the most heavily fortified in the world. You know, tons of barbed wire fence and, you know, tower guards. It's got a bit of an ominous, ominous feel to it. Uh, and so, you know, we'll drive and we'll approach this uh, pavilion, the visitors, visitors pavilion, where we get registered and we'll join then with the sort of official uh, vehicles that take us to the various stops. There's a brand new observation center, which when you go to the top, you're literally peering over this valley and you're overlooking 
North Korea. And it's really quite fascinating. There's telescope or like there's, you know, those um, like binocular telescope type things up there. So you can sort of look over at what's going on on the other side. Um, we'll also visit the so-called third tunnel, uh, which is a fascinating. Not every, you don't have to do this with you if you don't want. For those that are claustrophobic, it may not be so exciting, but you go down to where the North Koreans uh, had uh, about 30 years ago had dug a tunnel and tried to go underneath to be, to be able to um, invade South Korea. And of course they discovered this um, and now have turned it into a bit of a, a tourist attraction. But again, fascinating to see um, you know, what all of the antics that have gone on, um, you know, over the years since the, you know, the division of the two countries, we'll see the train station as well up there, where they still have the, the um, only place where uh, the two countries are linked by rail. Uh, and again, and I, I remember there's a great pavilion there that gives you a sort of a little bit of the history as to all the things that happened um, along this border. So uh, this is certainly an exciting day. Uh, and uh, we will, um, you know, come back into town in the afternoon and we have a little bit of a more or less time every day when we are into to uh, Seoul to be able to look around poke around on our own and the nice thing about Seoul is, is that ha it has um, a very extensive and one of the most modern clean efficient uh, transit systems in the world it covers everywhere so um, uh, certainly I would uh, take it upon myself, you know, if, if I'm uh, going on this trip uh, to uh, figure out some other parts of town to go in because it's so uh, spread over such a large area that you'll you'll want to go out and uh, venture around a little bit. And that's why we've organized the trip with time to do that. We'll spend another day uh, to visit a bit more of the historic, the religious side. Uh, of course, uh, Korea being a center of uh, Buddhism, we'll visit the Jogyesa Temple, uh, which is basically the, the center of Korean Bo Buddhism and, and really fant uh, fantastic. I, we don't, I don't put a lot of emphasis on to sort of the temples and the religious sites on these because there's time for those that want to explore that to another level. But I think places like Jogyesa are really, really worth visiting because you get to understand a little bit what differentiates the Buddhism in Korea from what we'll see in Japan, from what you know, from what you might see in other places. Um, we're also going to go uh, along the uh, Chongyechon Stream, which is what you see here. This is an 11-kilometer-long sort of urban river, um, and I remember walking through this with our members the last time, and it's really fact because they've taken this, you know, what could otherwise be like a drainage basin, like a sewage basin, and they've turned it into um, you know, an urban walkway. We were not going to walk along the whole 11 kilometers, although during the free day, you might want to come and do that. And you can see what they've done. They've got in some places sculptures and, and various uh, forms of, uh, you know, public art. Uh, they've got landscaping in parts. It's really a cool thing that they've done to connect such a wide part of the city. Um, from here, we're then going to go up the Namsan cable car, uh, which uh, goes to the base of Seoul Tower that we saw in an earlier picture. And here's when you'll really get that aerial view of the city where you see how, you know, sp how spread out the city is. You can't even see to the edge of it um, in, in many directions. It's a, it's a vast, vast, vast city. Um, and finally, we'll spend some time at the uh, Guangzhou Market, which is the foodie part of this uh, part of the tour, because, uh, you know, you can't go to a place like Korea and you know, go and sample the street food. And because this is the, this is the time when the, the host, uh, whether it's me or one of my other hosts and together with our local guide, we're gonna encourage you to try this, try that, um, take a bite of things that you probably otherwise wouldn't order on your own in a restaurant, but you get a chance to sample some of the different textures and flavors and all those things that, uh, that make the food so great. And as I say, of course, you're, there's a full day that's free by this time, you know, we'll have already been in uh, Korea for four days. Um, you'll be uh, relaxed enough to, to know that the city is completely safe to be able to go out on your own. You could go out to, uh, to do a tea ceremony. Um, you might go back out. Um, they have a, a skyscraper on a different part of town. So ride the subway. Uh, they have a terrific, super modern library um, in one of the parts of town adjacent to the river. So many different things that you could do. Uh, and again, there's a whole day to 
devoted to that um, before we have to say goodbye. And then from here, uh, we'll then continue and fly from Seoul into Tokyo, Haneda, which is where we'll then join up with those who are going to come and, and just do Japan. Uh, and uh, so that's the Korea portion of, portion of the program. At the end of Japan uh, is going to be Taiwan. And so I put these three together because I thought, what better way to sort of get uh, the, this, this contrast between cultures, having Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, obviously t Taiwan being the Republic of China, not the People's Republic of China, as we all know what the politics are for that. Um, and so you get to sort of compare how these cultures in some ways are similar, but in other ways are really completely different. So uh, so that's why I thought Taipei was a, as a perfect way thing to do after uh, um, uh, Japan. And so we will fly uh, from Tokyo, where the Japan trip obviously ends directly down to uh, to Taipei, the capital, <clears throat> excuse me, the capital of Taiwan, which sits at the northern end of the island. The island of Taiwan, again, it practically gets lost on the on the global map because it's really roughly the size of Belgium. Um, but Taiwan has 23 million people in it, so twice as many as there are in Belgium. And so um, on one hand, the cities, the whole western coast is quite densely populated, cities like Taipei and Kaohsiung uh, and you know, it's all, it's practically one big city all the way down the East Coast, sorry, the West Coast. But the East Coast, on the other hand, is all mountainous and lots of nature. And when we take the train from Taipei down to Kaohsiung, we'll get a good sense of what the landscape of the country is like. Um, so we're going to arrive into Taiwan. And we're staying here in the so called Jinji part of Taiwan, which again is right downtown in the middle it's it's the, the the neighborhood is kind of known as the the manhattan of taipei this is where also taipei 101 that big tall tower is uh and so we're gonna um uh check into a lovely again little boutique hotel called the humble house hotel uh and again this is the neighborhood here where taipei 101 is that we're going to be staying right in the heart of the city um, and again, you'll find a, in, in some ways you'll find similarities between Taipei and uh, Tokyo or Kyoto and Seoul because they're very modern cities. They're very clean. They're very efficient. Um, but here you definitely feel a little bit of that, you know, it's, it's hard to even describe, but it has that more Chinese feel than the Japanese. The Japanese, again, that's like the Switzerland in this in this three sum of countries. Um, and uh, and but at the same time, you know, Taipei is still just as safe as uh, either uh, Japan or uh, Korea. So you can wander out from the hotel, be in the thick of everything, uh, and uh, not have any concerns at all. So uh, by the time we check and arrive again, no big plans for our first day uh, when we get to Taipei, but we'll go out and have a traditional, very nice Taiwanese dinner. And then once again, in our program here, we're going to take in some of the highlights, if you will, the more touristic highlights, we're going to go to Chiang Kai-shek Memorial. Chiang Kai-shek, of course, uh, was the sort of the founder, if you will, of uh, Taiwan. Uh, and so he is need, revered in the city, and they built an incredible uh, memorial center to him uh, that is, is really a must-see. Um, we're going to go up Taipei 101 while we're in uh, this area as well. At one time, it was the tallest building in the world, not, of course, the tower, because, of course, that was the CN Tower, all of which have since been eclipsed uh, by bigger bigger buildings in Asia. And then we're going to visit the National Palace Museum, which has hundreds of thousands of very cool ancient Chinese artifacts dating back to the Ming and Jing uh, and Qing sort of dynasties. Fascinating stuff. Uh, and uh, a full day, but nevertheless, one that will you'll immediately sort of, you know, get that, um, uh, the feel of the city, the feel of Taiwan and that, the, you know, the, the, the Chinese influence there. And, you know, of course, we know that, you know, Taiwan is, is Chinese. And in fact, 98% of the population are not um, ethnic Taiwanese. They've only got about a half a million of the original Taiwanese 
uh, indigenous people left in the country. The vast majority have obviously come in from China um, from uh, you know decades past. Uh, and, but of course, the, the the pride of the Taiwanese people, and you know, you you see it how they're standing up to uh, China in 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 this sort of geopolitical games that are going on right now. It's it's immediately apparent from the people. They're quite different to their colleagues from the mainland. Um, if anything, you find that the dynamic is a little bit more like Hong Kong. Um, so we're also going to take a day across the country, as you will have seen from the map that I showed at the beginning. We're going to go by so-called HRS train. That's their high-speed train in Taiwan, very similar to the bullet train that you'll find in Japan. We can cross the whole country from the north tip to the south tip. It's about 300 kilometers um, in just about an hour and a half. And we arrive into the beautiful city of Kaohsiung. And in Kaohsiung, uh, we're going to, you know, when you when we leave the railway station, which is super modern building in and of itself, we're immediately going to see the what they call the Moon World Badland. So you 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 get to see some of the outskirts of the city, uh, which is a very unique geological formation. If you think about the Badlands in the U.S., it kind of is reminiscent of that. Um, we're going to visit uh, the uh, largest monastery in Taiwan. That's actually what's pictured here. Uh, a phenomenal facility. Um, um, and again, you can't help but to be taken aback um, by the sort of the architectural marvel that it is, but also the devotion of, uh, you know, the, 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 the reverence of the Buddhist culture, uh, Buddhist religion that's there. It's really, really quite amazing. Um, and uh, uh, another highlight for that day will be the dragon and tiger pagodas, beautifully colorful pagodas that are uh, in a different part of the city uh, that we get to walk out into over the water really very cool um, and we'll end up with a little boat ride in the river of love uh, which is the one that passes through Kaohsiung and by the end of the afternoon we hop back on the HRS train 300 kilometers later we'll be back um, at our hotel comfortably in time for dinner in Taipei so uh, it's you know this is one of those days where the journey is more than half the fun because I think that we're not accustomed to high-speed rail travel in Canada. Uh, and so being able to do it in Taiwan, as we will also do in Japan, is really quite a treat. Uh, our next day in Taiwan will be all about the uh, the flavors. So it'll be like the foodie tour. Um, we're going to go out and uh, take a, uh, a bit of a step into street food. We're going to learn how to some of these things are prepared. And once again, we're going to make sure that you try some of these different things, the sizes, the shapes, the colors will be unfamiliar to you. And some things I can, I'm certain you won't like, but I think there's many other things that you'll say, ah, that's an interesting, unique taste. I wouldn't necessarily order it every day, but this is part of the beauty, particularly of traveling in East Asia is that, you know, their sense of cuisine is so entirely different from what ours is. Um, and although in general on this trip, we're going to sort of mix up. So you're not going to have only Chinese food in Taiwan. Uh, and you're not going to have only Japanese food in Japan. Um, we've, uh, you know, we, it's one of the improvements that we've made on, on our trips because we, we know there's only so much of this cuisine that one really wants to take and still enjoy the holidays. So, um, but as I say, uh, we will definitely take a little deeper dive into the local um, street food, which is a big part of the culture there. Uh, and uh, in the afternoon, we're going to visit the um, da Dao Deng, which is the oldest just district in Taiwan. So uh, in sorry, in Taipei, and that'll give you a flavor of where the city sort of came from 100 years and more ago. Uh, and I think that that um, well, yeah, all in all make for a really nice day. Um, the last day in Taiwan will be again completely free. Um, if you're somebody that loves to see these colorful temples, um, you could spend days just visiting uh, the different golden temples and pagodas and so on and so forth that exist. Um, you might want to head to the outskirts of the city. Uh, you can uh, even take a day tour that takes you up into the mountains that are not far outside of uh, Taiwan, uh, outside of Taipei. Um, uh, there's, or, you know, you might just want to run or just take the time to meander around the downtown part of the city, Xinyi, the neighborhood you're in, and do a bit of shopping because for those that are going to complete the trip and head back to Canada, it'll be the last and perhaps best opportunity to, um, 
um, to buy a bunch of stuff. Electronics here, of course, uh, is something a lot of people like to stick in their bags for the for the way home. And we'll round off the whole thing with a wonderful uh, Taiwanese banquet dinner uh, before flying out the next day, uh, either back home or to our ongoing destination. So I hope that gives you a bit of a flavor of what the trips are all about. Of course, the details are in the updated Japan brochure, which has uh, the detailed program as well as the pricing and the inclusions. Uh, so for the South Korea portion, uh, just to give you the sense here, we are looking at 2,500 bucks uh, double occupancy and actually quite a reasonable single occupancy price for those traveling on their own and similar a little bit more. Um, I was happy that we were able to keep these prices as reasonable as we could considering that um, particularly in Taiwan, we found that prices have gone, wow, they're, they're up uh, a good 20% uh, from where they were before the pandemic. So um, nevertheless, I think it represents quite good value uh, inclusion as you see here, we've got these lovely hotels. Um, we've got transportation cards for the free days. We've got breakfast every day. We've got some wonderful uh, English speaking local guides um, and some terrific other lunches and dinners that we'll do along the way. That's both in uh, Taipei as well as in Seoul. And again, details. Um, you can find in the brochure. And apart from that, um, as I say, the only thing that's extra is airfare, which of course you can link this all together. So you can uh, do your uh, trip from Canada to uh, Seoul uh, and then do the, the local hops from Seoul to Tokyo and then Tokyo to Taipei and then do what we call an open jaw, fly back from Taipei to Canada. Doesn't really make a huge impact on the airfare. Taipei is a little further away, so that adds a little bit to the price, but it should all uh, sort of fall into range, I expect. Uh, and again, it, the jury's a little bit out for next year where the prices are going to come in at because not all of the Trans-Pacific air routes are operating again. Um, but you should be hopefully in around these ranges here for economy class airfare from uh, Canada to any of these cities, be it Seoul, uh, Tokyo or Taipei. Uh, good. So I think that covers off most of the details. Uh, time for Q&A. Uh, and I'm going to jump the gun because I've uh, once again, I didn't uh, talk about the weather, but of course we're traveling in May, which is pretty much the perfect time because these countries get pretty warm uh, if you get further into the summertime. And similarly, uh, Korea is quite chilly in winter. So I think May is the optimal season. Um, you're probably going to have temperatures in Korea that are going to be definitely in the uh, around the 20 to 25 degrees um, in, uh, in early May. That could be a little bit cooler during the day, certainly in the evening. Um, Taipei will be warmer for sure. Uh, it's probably going to be in the mid twenties by this time in May, maybe even a little bit warmer. So, uh, and, uh, rain is a possibility anytime, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, they don't, it's not generally super rainy in, in, in May. So, uh, so Paula, if the, with the weather question was there, then, uh, I'll, uh, I jumped the gun on that one. No, all good. Uh, I, I'm having issues chatting, putting anything in the chat box. So if oh. anyone else is as well, be sure to yeah. enter in. Ooh. Yeah, it says that I can only okay. send it to uh, hosts and panel like to oh, us internally. So if okay. anyone else is having an issue, you can use the Q&A box to enter your questions because uh, I haven't had anything come in. Okay. Well, that's fine. Maybe that means we've addressed all the questions, but I'm sure you must have some. Uh, we try to be very thorough in our materials, uh, whether it's the uh, the actual main program itinerary itself. We also have an additional information document that we send you if you uh, with together with the booking form if you're interested. So that will cover off a lot of the other questions that you might have. But of course, we're always here. Um, if you do have any questions, just drop us a note. Oh, I'll go back to that page. I think in the meantime, most everyone knows how to reach us um, by email, by phone. Uh, that's the best way to get a hold of us. And uh, we're happy to answer any questions. And I guess if no other questions came in, then we can wrap up. I said it would take 20 minutes. Oh, it's been 28. Nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed it today. Uh, I always enjoy presenting this stuff. I love these places. Uh, and um, we will catch up with you soon. And in our newsletter this week will be our upcoming webinar dates. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Take care of yourselves. Uh, enjoy summer. And uh, I'm certainly enjoying it here. Uh, and uh, we'll see you all very soon, uh, probably in about a week or two's time. Take care. Have a great day.